Okay, and your current marital status? Married. You're married, you have children? Yes, two. Two children, and grandchildren? Oh, wait a minute, I have three children. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, three three children. grandchildren. <laughs> Is that three grandchildren? Grandchildren of two. Two, oh. okay. All right, where were you born, George? Milton, Massachusetts. And raised there, or? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and at what age did you come to Natick? Uh, see, 1952, 1953, I was, uh, what, 40? You do the math. Yeah, <laughs> 40, 40. Okay, so you've been a, a townie for 40 years. 47 years. 47 yeah. years. Uh, why, why did you come to Natick? Well, because uh, my wife was an employee at Wellesley College. I was in the insurance business in all metropolitan Boston, mm -hmm. uh, customers. Well, I was an insurance broker and agent. And uh, so on the schools, uh, the schools were excellent. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what was Natick like when you got here? That was quite a few years ago. It was primarily agricultural, I would say. The farms were still operating here? Are the farms? No, there's just the uh, <coughs> Natick Community Farm, which I was one of the mm -hmm. co authors up. Were you really? <laughs> and uh, so we've been going 20, 21, 22 years. And you were able to make a left turn when you went out in traffic. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> what was your family background? Can you tell me about your mother and father? Well, my dad was an insurance uh, broker and a partner in a general agency in Boston. And uh, my mother was at home. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Very typical. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, at what age did you join the military? Uh, see, that was in 1930. See, I joined the military in 1942. So that would. You do the arithmetic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll do it later. You joined in 42. Uh, and where and uh, when? I think I was uh, 30. And 30 years old. Uh, All right. I was, I was more than that, 35, I guess. Mm. Yeah. And when and where did you uh, enlist? Pardon? When and where did you join the military? Uh, Fort Devon. Uh, well, that was my first post, but I enlisted in Boston. Mm -hmm. And what branch of the service? In the Army, and in particular, one of the 87th Mountain Regiment, which is at Fort Lewis in Washington. But typically of the military, they get things kind of messed up. And Why did you... Thought, uh, they thought that that request was referring to uh, IRTC in California. <laughs> Well, Leo Satan Kangas and I went all the way to, to California. He was a Finnish fellow that li lived up here in, uh, oh, well, up in western Massachusetts. Why did you join the Army instead of, uh, say, the Navy or Well, the we Air knew Corps? what was going on at this point. We knew what was going on in Germany, and uh, uh, Ignoring civil rights and genocide and all that sort of thing, and the way they were taking over, the way they're steamrolling over everybody, mm -hmm. and going that way, you got to stop it. And uh, so there, are, what six million other guys? <laughs> yeah, you had your preface uh, preference. Uh, you might have joined the Navy or the Air Corps. Why the Army? Well, I like, I like the land and I'm more familiar with it and I thought I'd be more effective in it. All right, and you said a moment ago that you wound up out in uh, ski country somewhere. Can you tell us how that happened? I mean, after I... Uh, yes, you went to Fort Devens, is that correct? Fort Devens, yeah. Yeah. And then, then my orders <clears throat> were cut there to report at Camp Hale in Colorado. What kind of training did you get at Fort Devens? At Fort Devens, you got none. 
you were just... We did all the dirty jobs, like clean the oven and <laughs> shingle the building and paint old World War I tents that all I've grabbed. So you were waiting to be reassigned to go yeah, somewhere yeah. else? All, everything that nobody else wanted to do. Okay. <laughs> did friends or family uh, join with you, or do you ent uh, did you enter the service uh, I went by all, yourself? All by myself. Yeah. All by yourself. Yeah. And tell us where you went from Fort Devens. Uh, Fort Devens, I went to Camp Roberts in California, San Miguel, California. And what did you do there? I had basic training. Infantry training. So you became a combat infantry man? Well, yes, you'd say that, but uh, I, I, we wouldn't designate it until you actually were in a combat zone, would you? I, I guess that's quite yeah. true, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we won't argue the point anymore. <laughs> All right, you're out in California and you're getting infantry training. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? What did you do? Well, you landed there and you were initiated, they gave you a little booklet and, then, and they told you all the pitfalls and problems and how to, <laughs> you know, uh, well if you do this, why it's punishable by death, if, it, if it's lesser, why it's company punishment. <laughs> you know, all, all that sort of the, thing. The if, rules and regulations. If you want something, yeah. you, you don't go up to the commander, you, you go to your immediate, you say you are, of course I was a recruit, which has no gauge at all, <laughs> because when you're finally, uh, you, you're a private, you're designated as a private when you finish your basic training. That's correct. Yeah. And uh, then I later went on to office uh, candidate school at Fort Benning in Georgia. You went from California to Georgia? Georgia, yeah. And you went to OCS? And I was a corporal. Yeah. Uh, you were a corporal after you finished basic training? No. no. Uh, I, yes, I was a corporal when I finished basic training. And then did you apply to go to OCS? Uh, yes. And you were accepted, obviously? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us, uh, well, let's go back a minute here. Um, did you develop close friendships while you were in basic training? Get to know people that you uh, oh, yes, were in touch with? Oh yes, there were a couple of fellows. And we still, well, one of them died, but there's still Christmas cards and whatnot. To You're the, the, still the in touch with them. with them if they're alive. Really? So. Did the, some of these fellows serve with you? Yes, yeah, um, in Kiska. Right, right through Kiska, the war? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And what was your specialty as you went into OCS? In, in, in my specialty? Infantry. All right. Can you tell us something, uh, what happened to you at uh, Fort Benning? What, what was the training like there? Well, it was uh, not too unlike the uh, basic training, but more sophisticated. You took up map reading and uh, Mm -hmm. and how to keep all the company books, the morning report and requisitions and all that sort of thing. There's a lot to it, more than meets the eye. <laughs> you, know, on you. you were learning uh, management and leadership skills, yeah. is that yeah. it? Um, what, did you like that kind of work uh, or dislike it? What was your impression of being at Fort Benning? Well, I can't say I liked it, <laughs> but I wouldn't say I disliked it. I think, well, I enjoyed the uh, old like things like map reading and that sort of thing, but uh, these housekeeping details, yeah. <laughs> I didn't, didn't cherish those. Did the military prepare you for the um, cultural differences that you would face when you were a ship, say, overseas or into a totally different clime? Well, I'll put it this way, uh, when you're on, not on in basic training and what you're doing in the military, you uh, men come from all 
uh, all kinds of places and all kinds of different uh, uh, occupations and whatnot. Yes. And these people you'd never had an advantage of meeting or doing anything with them until you got into the military and then everybody's on common ground until you start to get brass on your shoulders. And <laughs> then it becomes <laughs> then, then quite you're uncommon. Next to yes. God. <laughs> How long was your tour at Fort Benning? Ninety days. Ninety well, day wonders. You were a ninety day wonder. <laughs> <laughs> That's a term that was applied to lieutenants you came out of uh, first lieutenant? First, second lieutenant. A sec, excuse second me, lieutenant. a second lieutenant. Gold color, the brass color. Yeah. Uh, and then what happened to you? What, what happened Where to Where did you? you go from there? Oh, let's see. This is after I got out of Fort Bank. Oh, I was assigned, uh, assigned to the 87th Mountain Regiment at Camp Hill, Colorado. You were assigned to a mountain regiment. Do you had anything in your background that suggested to the Army that this would be appropriate for you? Well, in order to be in the 87th Mountain Regiment, you had to be uh, 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 instructed. Uh, in other words, they, you went before the National Ski Patrol, one of the people and they gave you an examination and I took my examination up at Cranmore Mountain, uh, which we call it Wind Potter I guess, and <laughs> uh, was, my instructor, was my instructor up there. Can I assume you were a skier before you went into the yes. Army? Mm -hmm. So you had strong skills that the Army could use? Yeah, skills and also we had mules. And, uh, I'd never had anything to do with mules until I was in the army, but we had horses when I was a youngster. We had two horses in the barn. <laughs> Would were you pleased with this assignment? Oh yeah. Is this something you yeah, asked this for? This is what I asked for. Yeah. So you got what you asked for in the army. Right. That yeah. was most unusual, wasn't it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now where are you in? You're in Colorado. Yeah. And can you tell us approximately what date this was in 42? Uh, it was in 1942, November 42. So your, your training and your officer's training uh, brought you now in November 42 to Colorado mm -hmm. where you're in a ski... Um, Mountain Infantry. Mountain Infantry Organization. Yeah. Tell us about what happened there. What happened? Yeah, what, what were you doing there? Well, you went, you went out in the field climbing the mountains and camping for a week or two weeks and up in the mountains at 10,000 feet. And so if you got breakfast while well, you had a mess kit that you piled snow in and fired up your little lamp and <laughs> gasoline stove and uh, melt the snow in order to boil your cereal. <laughs> and so you're outdoor cooking and, and uh, well, uh, other clothing and all that sort of thing. And like uh, one of the things you might laugh at was you took your shoes to bed with you and to bed at night. Because if you didn't, they'd be frozen stiff and you couldn't get into them. Yeah, it, yeah. That's, that's a very basic thing to learn, isn't yeah. it? You had to be very careful that uh, you didn't get expose your feet to cold and wet for a period of time because you'd get trench foot. I got it. <laughs> were the men who were with you uh, equally trained or their backgrounds were in skiing and in winter th um, outdoor activity? Well, as we, uh, Mountain Training Center, was, I would say, was the head of it. In other words, there was no division or no division commander that came later. But they had Mountain, uh, Mountain Training Center, and they were experimenting with a lot of equipment, like uh, 
Uh, one thing that stands out in my mind is the stoves. And the stoves had a peculiar pack saddle that went on the mules. And they had chains which held the door latch and that sort of thing. So we got it on the mule way. The chains would rattle and bang and it scared the daylights out, <laughs> out of the mule. So, uh, so that, that isn't going to work. When we finally found out that it did work, it took a little doing with the Army. That when they brought these things out and put them on, it says the darn thing won't work. And, oh no, you put them on. <laughs> so, let's see. Oh, one of the, one of the mule, mule skinners. Was, we were going out into the field this morning and he, he went out across the Eagle River on the bridge and just see he's coming across the bridge by uh, six by six, two and a half, six by six, came down the road and it was backfiring and, uh, and the adjustment was bad. And this put the mule scared and <laughs> so uh, the mule skinner, he was trying to hold him and uh, he, he couldn't, he fell down and the mule fell down and the stove came down like that and put the leg of the stove up through his jaw. So that was an example that, of the thing did that why, kill why him? they have to test things. And did that kill him, George? They should have said, George, why? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but they don't do that. Anymore. So the, the equipment, if you found it faulty, did the Army change it? Yes, they did. They did. Oh, one thing was my brother was in the Quartermaster Corps in Washington, D.C. And uh, so certain things like out on Kiska, after the Japanese weren't there, but we were, the Japanese put men on Kiska because they wanted to divert the United States Army from uh, going in at Midway. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess it worked. <laughs> we, we've, we've made a big jump here now. Mm -hmm. From Colorado, um, were you shipped to Kiska in the Aleutians? Yes, yeah, yeah. Would you that tell... Was in June of 40. In June three. in 44? 43. 43. Yeah. Okay. Would you tell us where Kiska is? It's next to the last island in the Aleutian chain. At uh, latitude was, I think it was 44, 44 north. The Japanese had the, invaded these eight, islands, um, Attu and Kiska. Attu was the last one out on the chain. And then Kiska's Kiska. the next one up. And then came uh, Adak and Dutch and, and dipped down like that. Come up. How did you get there? How, how did, From Colorado, how did you get there? Ship. You sailed yeah. in. Yeah, Argentina was the, was the name of the ship. And what was your impression? The Italian, of this? the ship takes a battalion. I forget the name of the other ship. That was with us. Where did you sail from, George? We sailed from uh, uh, oh, Los Angeles. Los Angeles. Yeah. Did you know where you were going when you got on board the ship? Oh, it? No, it wouldn't be Los Angeles. It would be San Francisco, the Golden Gate 48 weeks. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us your impression of it when you sailed up into the Aleutian Islands. Aleutian Islands? It was cold and windy, and if there was a storm, you got uh, waves of 30 feet. Uh, one thing, when we were coming back from Kiska, why we received, they broke radio silence. And uh, they tell us to go to the aid of a, one of Kaiser's ships that he built in a day. And it had broken in half just in front of the bridge. As the skipper, instead of going with the storm, <laughs> a little, just keeping steerage and just going with it, he went up into it. He go up to the top of one of these waves and it come down, boom, like that, and then the ship go. Fatigue the metal is just like taking anything up. Yes, <laughs> yes. Break off. So 
when took you took us two and a half days, and they lo lost the whole, lost them all. Everything. Yeah, eight eight men. Yeah. When you got to Kiska, um, were the Japanese gone by this time? They were time? gone. Yeah, and they uh, left their calling card. What What does that mean? Oh, booby traps and mines and stuff. So when you went ashore, what were your duties to be? What were you going to do? You go there? in and take the high ground as fast as possible. And tell That's us one of the primary techniques of mountain warfare. That's the 87th Mountain Regiment went into Italy. Yeah. And up across the Po Valley and uh, Mount Belvedere. And they were the first outfit that got through there. How long were you in Alaska? Uh, see, we went in in August and came out in November. Four months. And during that time, uh, was there some thought uh, that the Japanese might reinvade? We were always on the alert because they did come over from Paramashira and uh, with the airplanes to bomb, but they were greeted with a little anti-aircraft. <laughs> yes. And they left. They were more or less reconnaissance, I guess, because they didn't do too, didn't do too much. When but you had to watch out, I mean, you put your ammo dumps and disperse them and put them yes, in, be very careful. in the brook bed and all that sort of thing. When you were there, was your equipment appropriate to the climate? Yes. Your your feet, yeah. uh, your boots and clothing, I and you were up there in November. Say, we had we had some boots and they were dandy and they were what they call blucher boots. I think they were manufactured down Stoughton, Massachusetts, and they were good. They were well, the leather and whatnot. There is they call it a blucher boot. They were expensive for civilians and all that sort of thing. That they worked fine. But then, when we were over in Europe, oh, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I want to ask you more about the the place was booby tracked uh, when you got there. Yes. Were men killed or injured by these things? Yes. Can you tell us uh, an incident about uh, well, the, the booby trapping? That I saw or, or heard of. Or heard of? Yeah. yeah. Well, the <clears throat> the technique that the Japs used was you were invading and they'd let you come through. So they had set up these uh, uh, defenses around the artillery pieces that they had in order to attack you, let us say, from the rear. <laughs> and that, that sort of thing. Well, some of these things were the, they left defense in the form of uh, landmines. So that, that was that was it, yeah. Yeah, all righty. You left in November? Yeah. And where did you go from there, George? Uh, Seattle, Fort, uh, Fort Lewis in Seattle. You, you sailed this over? Is just, yeah. This is just waiting to uh, uh, get a troop train to take us down to uh, Camp Carson in Colorado. So you were back in Colorado again. That's right. Yeah. And this is about uh, 43? 43, yes. 43 at uh, maybe December or something? Yes. And what, and what did you do when you were back in Colorado? We were back in Colorado where they uh, changed the, it was the 85th and the 86th regiments had been activated up at Camp Hale, and then the 87th Regiment was a mountain regiment, listed so, and they did away with the mountain regiment and replaced it with a light regiment on the table of organization. In the light, organiza light infantry organization, there was no heavy weapons company. I was in the mortar, um, platoon leader of the mortar platoon of Company M. So we're, we're guns out. <laughs> and 
Was that so the end? So they left me, uh, I stayed on at Carson, and we trained two instruments of infantry. Were you still um, an organization that was going to fight in or be in uh, using skis or uh, bad weather, or was this just a normal uh, Army infantry organization now? I think the 90th, 90th Infantry, Norwegian, no, it was a battalion, 90th, oh, Norwegian Infantry Battalion went over and they uh, were instrumental in getting rid of those heavy water plants, so which they're a plan to make bombs out of, mm -hmm. and uh, they d destroyed that. Now, was this part of your that group? That was the Norwegians. They, the, they weren't part of us, no, they were, they trained with us. I see, Yeah. I see. They were a good bunch of guys, and they... <laughs> and they went on to something very spectacular, didn't yes, they? Yes. Did they sink a ship, a German ship carrying the heavy water? Well, I had never heard of that, no. Okay. Yeah. Well, what happened to you now? You're leaving, you're... We trained two you're, increments of infantry. And you're in now in, in an infantry a, replacement training center. And you're in charge of a mortar outfit? No, I'm teaching everything. It has to do with the infantry. All right. And how long were you there then, George? Uh, let's see. I was transferred into the 99th Division, who were in Camp Maxi in Paris, Texas. And they were on maneuvers, what they call D series. And they were on maneuvers, and we joined them. And I was assigned to M Company again. <laughs> Same M Company, <laughs> the, yeah. Uh, 99th Division. What does D series mean in terms of training? They're out, and they're just really playing war, and using all the equipment and whatnot. And can you tell us again about what time of the year this was? Uh, this is uh, August, September, yeah. September. All right. And what did you do we after? Went, went, went with them, uh, 393rd Infantry, who went to um, England, Wales, England. Oh, Camp let's, D6 let, let's not go that fast. Went from Paris, Texas, how did you get to England then? Paris, Texas, by boat, by railroad to Camp Miles Standish in Taunton, and then from Boston uh, by boat uh, to Portsmouth, England, and then by truck up to little Camp D6 in the town of Piddle Hinton. <laughs> Piddle Hinton? <laughs> Piddle Hinton. <laughs> right. <laughs> what did you do at that new camp now? And are, were, were you uh, with all the men you had trained with? Right. You were, were you with men. all the men you had right. trained right. with? Right. Yeah. And what did you do at this camp? Uh, we got our ammunition and uh, tanks and tank destroyers and all that heavy equipment, radar and whatnot, and loaded loaded the ship up in uh, Portsmouth. And then we went across the English Channel in uh, oh, what was it? It was a it was a Dutch. I think it was a Dutch steamer, Channel steamers they call them, and. Uh, the uh, skipper of it was an infantry lieutenant, I think. So he asked us after he'd uh, acquainted us with what he expected of us in, uh, on the ship. I asked the question, well, why does this ship list so heavily to starboard? He says, oh, the, he had Alaska crew, and they were black as a black group. I mean, they were real dark. <laughs> fierce-looking people who wore feathers and <laughs> whatnot. He, he says, 
all the scoundrels loaded them in wrong. <laughs> <laughs> what are we supposed to do? Run the other side of the ship to come around? <laughs> Balance it off. Yeah. yeah. We landed in at uh, Le Havre, and uh, which was occupied by the French at that time. And uh, yeah, we landed at Le Havre in a landing craft, and uh, went up across the beach and loaded onto trucks and went up went up the Seine Valley to Dinan, Namur, Liège, Belgium. We ended up there um, in a farmer's <laughs> pear orchard and it was miserable snowing, half snowing and half raining and mm -hmm. mud and <laughs> Lord knows what all. And uh, so I wanted to take care of my platoon if I could. I mean, this is a lousy thing to be out all night in this kind of stuff. So uh, I went to ask the farmer if the men could sleep in the barn. And I couldn't, I'd forgotten my French and forgotten the name of a barn. So I said, I I'd like to if my men could occupy the Maison de Vache, <laughs> which translates as House of the Cows. <laughs> Did he get the idea? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, let us stay there. We helped him with his chores. <laughs> you just mentioned snow. Yeah. Uh, this is, can you be as specific as possible as to when this was, what time this was, the dates? Well, see, we were up in the uh, uh, the barrel, the balls up in the, the name of the towns up there. The, it was right up on the border of uh, you know, Belgium, Did Belgium, and the, okay. The secret on the on the way up there from Belgium up to Krinkelt. We, uh, the uh, road was under intermittent artillery fire. We were, Jim saw a new outfit coming up while we were given the business. <laughs> so that was our first in, encounter. So to speak. You were under fire for the first yeah, time then. Yeah. Did you feel your officers were giving you good leadership at a time that was pretty tenuous for you? I, th I think uh, on the long-range planning, it was uh, you didn't have too much control over that. I mean, uh, I'm a company-grade officer, so to speak, so you would be asking me, did I think the captain, uh, yes, I thought he was very concerned about his troops and did the best he could, but you go higher up and I think they were, did a, they were a bunch of duds. They thought that a war would be over before winter set in. And so we lost, what, 45,000 men with a uh, trench foot. You're about to become involved in the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, yes. You're leading yeah. up to that. Yeah. Um, this is one of the greatest battles in Europe, and you were part of it. Yeah. Can you tell us what you know about it or where where you participated? Oh. Citizen Soldier. Have you read that book? I just finished it last night. Well, I went back and read it again because I knew I was going like. to talk to you this morning. That's what it's like. <laughs> no problem. All right, then start with his, I guess, his we arrived up on the line. We were uh, we were replacing the first division. We had no map. We didn't know where and how we were. We were just in the in the woods, <laughs> in a miserable climate, and whatnot. Yes. And well, I, I didn't get a map. I, I thought well, we're going back to the front after I get out of the hospital. Oh. 
I was going to have a map, so I went and bought one in Paris. You just said get, uh, that you got out of the hospital? Yeah. Why were you in the hospital? Well, because uh, I got hit in the foot. It was a superficial wound, but uh, I had my feet were frozen there, French foot. So. Were you shot, or was it shrapnel? It was a shrapnel. Uh, <clears throat> we were up there living in the foxholes in this miserable weather and whatnot, and everybody, you were, you were growing a beard and you were dirty and you smelt like a goat. And <laughs> I decided we'll do something about that but when, the, when it was snowing and fog. I uh, built a fire and put a couple of jerry cans, five gallon jerry cans, up against the um, 55 gallon drum which we would built the fire and heated the water. Then I sent the men in my platoon two at a time up to clean up and they came back and sent out two more. And my messenger and I were the last one. Um, then it decided not to snow and Jerry saw the smoke. <laughs> so he let go with a piece of artillery. I don't know what, what it was but anyway it has a distinguished sound. I mean, and uh, it was probably an 88, and uh, it hit a tree. Well, I didn't think anything of it. I, I, I called into the CP that we were receiving incoming mail, and uh, it wasn't until I was back at the aid station that they take your boot off and see what's there, that they found the, that it cut part of the boot, and part, part of it was me. <laughs> but I, I, had, I couldn't feel it, you know, because my feet were frozen. But that's why I was in the hospital for so long, for four months. Did you feel you got good medical treatment uh, yeah. when yeah. they took yeah. you back? Yeah. Oh, yeah. In, in the book you just mentioned, um, let's see if I can state this properly, that there was a great deal of chaos. Eisenhower felt that this was a great opportunity for the American army because if the Germans extended themselves he could pinch off the bulge. Yeah. Um, would you have agreed with that assessment at the time or were you just trying to stay alive? You were concerned with what was immediately around you. I mean, probably no more than 200 yards. This is your little realm. You didn't see the enemy, they were invisible. <laughs> well, yes, you'd see them. I think I only saw one. I mean, I think my son asked me that question once. I said yes. I saw one guy and I think he was trying to surrender. He, did, he didn't have, have any white flag or anything, but he just looked like he was not dangerous. <laughs> and it was coming in, let us say, to would rather be under his people than with us. Yes. Was he captured? Oh, yes, he was captured. Did your, did your equipment hold up? Um, again, the book says that most of the time you were cold or frozen because of inadequate uniforms, yeah. inadequate boots, inadequate, inadequate coats. Inadequate boots was the, the main trouble. I tried to forestall this uh, type of thing as I, we'd heard about uh, trench foot and how to prevent it and that sort of thing. So the general had come up, General Black of the artillery, came up to see what we were doing and how we were doing it. And then he was through with the inspection. He says, is there anything I can do for you? And I said, yes. He said, what's that? I said, I want a bale of hay. Okay, well, what are you going to do with a bale of hay? The men will put the hay in the bottom of their boots. And then they'll take those felts that come with the 81 millimeter mortar rounds that are used to cushion and put them in on top of the hay and that will insulate the boots. In a couple of hours I got a bale of hay. 
That's a great story. <laughs> That's a great story. Mm. The Battle of the Bulge lasted anywhere from, depending on your word, uh, mm. 10 to 20 days. Um, well, I was only involved with it a couple of days. And then the weather had a lot to do yeah, with it. Of course, you, you were receiving a bunch of artillery. That they, they came in quite a while. Uh, Malmody, you've probably heard of Malmody mm -hmm. Four Corners. You know. Yes. That, well, that was just down the road from the hospital I was in. And when did you know that you had survived and were going to survive? What, the Battle of the Bulge? Yes. I had no idea. Other than that, sometimes I wish you did get you. <laughs> I mean, you're so miserable sometimes you felt like she was. Yeah. I can't stand any more of this. <laughs> well, did there, was there a moment in your being there that you realized that you guys had won? That what? That you had won. We'd won the war? Well, you had turned back the German advance. Yeah. And the siege had been broken. Yeah. Where were you when that happened? When was that? I was in uh, Marburg. Marburg. I was on the way back up to the front, up to join my outfit, We're up there near the Berlin Circle in Marburg. And uh, the Germans were um, surrendering by the hordes. They wanted to get as far away from the Russians as they could. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, this is where we weren't in on information I think we should have had that uh, the, Germ the people would say that uh, the, what, are, what are you running away from the Russians for? And the higher ups knew that the Russians were our enemies. And we didn't realize it until we were on border patrol and they tried to capture you, they'd sneak across the border and, and try to kidnap people and uh, shoot people and go into a house and murder the people and take all the food or whatever they had. You were there. The uh, Russian individual soldier was a, was a good Joe. He like any other soldier, like any of the rest of us. We didn't care for this business of fighting the war. Who the heck wins one? Nobody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you were there during Christmas. Uh, you were there during that very famous Christmas Eve, yeah. where the both sides stopped for a while and sang songs, um, "Silent Night," largely. Yeah. W did you witness any of that? No. no, no. I was in the hospital. And did yeah. you had did you meet any of the Russians? Yes. And, and how about the British? Were they uh, part of any Border organization? Patrol, uh, how about the British? Oh, we didn't run into them. I mean, they were, they were guarding a border which is to the north of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we didn't run any. I got up there near, near that area when uh, I was a sent to medium ordnance maintenance school. That was later on in the occupation when we had a... You survived the Battle of the Bulge. Yeah. What, what did you do directly after? Which direction did your uh, unit move in? They moved in. They had retreated maybe five or six kilometers back and they just sat down there in the woods, hunkered down there and, and they <coughs> um, see what were they what were they doing now? They were Oh there was the mortars were behind a uh, what we call 
curvature of the earth, let us say. Yeah. Or a mound of dirt or whatnot. They were behind that, on top of that, they're the observers for the mortars. So we were shooting the Germans with the 81 millimeter mortars, and they would give a counter battery fire to, in back of us, because they felt, well, that's where the mortars were, and that's where the people would, the Germans would be. And we, we were, had the obser observers up, up front and, and put the 60 millimeter mortars up on the OP. And it was effective in keeping them nice down there in the woods. <laughs> when the, the weather finally broke, there was a great deal of aerial activity over your heads. Uh, did you witness any of that, the dropping of supplies or the um, shooting down of a great many airplanes in that area? I forget just where I was at that time, but I remember a whole of uh, the C-47s mm -hmm. uh, towing gliders behind them. And, uh, and they were going into, uh, I, I'm in a ninja in Holland up there. Had a good friend that was killed in that. He was in the medics. And there's nothing to get behind in Holland. I mean, it's just flat, except if you want to go into the canal. And these down gliders just landed in there, and there was the Germans just sitting there and like shooting fish in a barrel. <laughs> That's what I saw, that the, the gliders hauling the gliders in. Mm -hmm. Where did you? That was Montgomery's first army, uh, army up there. That was part of Market Basket, and I think, a bridge too far. Part, uh, yeah. Montgomery wanted to uh, go in through there, up, up across Holland and back. He wanted to go in that that way and across the Rhine, you know, on the other side of the Rhine. But uh, so he demanded all the ammunition and all the backup, whatnot. If we fired a round, we had to explain why we fired the round. <laughs> and uh, we weren't supposed to fire a round unless it was, we got permission or we knew darn well it would be effective. And uh, then, of course, uh, Patton. He did it the way he thought it should be done, and the heck with the rest of the stuff. <laughs> yes. If they'd stuck with Holland, we would never have been into a. Uh, we would ne never have been in a winter campaign. Because a patent just go through, and and what, Eisenhower tried to stop him. I mean, Eisenhower didn't want to get in touch with the. With the first army. Where did you go from there, George? Uh, where did your outfit go? Toward Germany, or uh, in what direction did you move in? Oh, um, what my outfit did, yes. Yeah, so they were one of the first outfits across the, uh, the bridge. Crossing the Rhine? Yeah. 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 They went on up through uh, the Ruhr Tosh and uh, up through there. Well, they had the 81 millimeter mortar set up in an old flag factory, which somebody dropped a bomb through. So here we had a nice shelter out of way <laughs> from the rain and whatnot. And we set up the mortars inside the factory so they couldn't see or hear it. And the Germans were over the other side of the Rhine in the Ruhr Tosh. <laughs> so we were sailing the mortar rounds up over the Rhine River into the over them over there. <laughs> what did you think about the Germans as the they men go, were fighting? They go right by the book. They go right by the did book. Did you have... With, uh, with exceptions. I was a commander of a prisoner of war camp. And one of the prisoners had gone into one of the, uh, where they had a platoon in, in a house, a shed, a 
Um, yeah, and there there were Italians and Polish uh, prisoners that the Germans <laughs> had. And uh, let's see where we get <laughs> losing the continuity here. I was just interested in your opinion of the Germans as. Uh, oh yes, yeah, yeah. One example of that was one fellow stole a chocolate bar, D bar, from another encampment there, and they caught him. So they evidently had held a court courts martial of their own, and uh, the ruling of the Geneva Convention was that they would try the culprit whatever he'd done, and then they'd come to the uh, Americans for, for a decision on it. Well, this happened and they came, the punishment should be, he'd dig a deep six and then he'd shoot him. He'd violated the SS code. I said, well, that's a little rough. Uh, I guess I'll leave it up to me. So uh, I had the man, he, he couldn't go into the camp. He had to pitch his tent out in the corner of the compound. And in the compound there were two two layers of fences, barbed wire. And there's the bork fence and then the outer fence. And, uh, and uh, he he couldn't eat his he couldn't eat his meals like he could go up to the mess hall and with his mess kit and pick up his food and then he'd sit down underneath the guard tower and eat his meal for one week. And then on Sunday, which was the day a day off in which we didn't work or that sort of thing, and uh, he had to come up before the group and apologize for stealing. <laughs> And stuff, and that was it. So the German colonel came to me and said, "American justice is very droll, but very effective." Effective. <laughs> it's better than being killed, I <laughs> think. Can you compare, um, from your experience, your equipment, your arms, uh, armament, uh, and uniforms? Well, of course, it, it, with I, the Germans, with what yeah, they had. Yeah, I visited uh, my brother-in-law at uh, Fort Bliss in Texas in 1937, and the Army's idea of an anti-tank weapon was a 50 caliber machine gun mounted on the running board of a scout car. So, what the the first tank that they had in the war was a Grant with a gun way over on one side. I forget what the caliber of it was. But that, that darn thing, why they, those tanks, they shoot at the German tank and they bounce right off them like a tennis ball. <laughs> and. Uh, The R rounds wouldn't 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 penetrate. And then later on, they had the hollow charge to put in. And one time, I was in demolition, so I understood the, that. <laughs> but did you feel your equipment was uh, inferior to what the Germans had? That theirs was inferior. No, no. It do you feel it was superior? I'd say a lot yeah. of the stuff they had. Well, typically German. If something was broken or knocked over, they didn't wait for us to come in and fix it. They just sat down and waited for something to happen. You take the Belgians and they, they would come right in <laughs> right away to straighten something out. Oh, and I see. It was all done within. You've had quite a career that spanned quite a bit of time and, and went in two different theaters of operation. Um, can you tell us what might have been the most memorable experience of your career in, in the military? 
military. I mean, in the, one outstanding. In the combat situation or in what, whatever or, or comes to mind for you. What what go, what goes on? Yeah. You know? Is there something that? Oh, well, I think is, is outstanding. I think the reorgan, yeah. reorganization, the, the peace treaty, and whatnot. I felt that the First World War, the uh, the uh, armistice there, was a armistice that would never work, and the, the Germany was bankrupt, and uh, Hitler came along. He had the I think he had the right idea to start with built the road, so you never saw an Autobahn in this country before the World War II. And the Germans gave the idea, of course it was all uh, Polish uh, labor, but it said he had the right idea for his country. But where he went wrong was like a lot of dictators, they, they become dictators and they aim to rule the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was wrong, and that was a greater wrong than what right. But there was an angle, there was a certain part of, that they were upholding justice by rearming against that er erroneous. Uh, we're getting in too deep, aren't we? <laughs> Maybe so. <laughs> well, I've had these feelings right along. I'm, I suppose I could be Amish. I'm against <laughs> war, but who's going to who's going to correct the wrong? And we were the only ones in a position to do so. Was there a any particular person that you served with that you remember more so than any other? A person I knew face to face. Or? Yeah. Mm. Well, I saw a patent. <laughs> well, I think General Black, who was a 393rd Infantry, or well, they had a particular designated number for the artillery. He's the one that gave you the, the bale of hay. Yeah, 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 yeah. And General Andrus, you know, when I was inspecting the, P he was inspecting the PW camp. Did you join any uh, veterans organizations when you came home? Or are you a member uh, of one now? 10th Mountain Division Association. Mm -hmm. And do you meet with them? Yes. Do you have reunions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What are they like? What stories do you tell? Oh, they're a good, they knew, knew how to have fun, and <laughs> they liked the open, and uh, they're an intelligent group. They weren't a bunch of dummies, and let's well, say they, you could sit down with them and express like we are expressing ourselves now. Well, what's right and what's wrong, and mm -hmm. wasn't that odd, or? <laughs> yes. When and where were you uh, discharged from the service? Uh, I was at uh, Camp Kilmer in New Jersey. And, and what was the date? Date? Uh, it was in Ju early July. It was almost, no, I was there on the 4th of July. I think it was the 5th of July. Of what year? 1947. 47, and then you went into the reserves, didn't Reserve, you? Yeah. And you stayed in the reserves 20 years, is that right? Yes, well, 22 years. Uh, to the rank 22 of? 22 years service, all told. And, and came out with the rank of major. Yes. Yeah. That's quite a career. <laughs> That's quite a career. Neat, but not gaudy. <laughs> <laughs> when you came home in, after discharge, um, the war had been over, and can you recall what it was like, uh, how you were met when you came home, the feeling of people toward the men in the service? Well, they were very much 
appreciative of our efforts. You know, because when I got out, I uh, like I made a deposit on an automobile, and uh, I came to pick up the automobile and give the guy the rest of the money, and he sold it to somebody else, <laughs> and he wouldn't give me my deposit back. He was a guy that was buying automobiles, new automobiles, and the price was modest for those days. And uh, so he was in the business of making money at my expense, and I resented it. There were other people that did that sort of thing too, like ration tickets, they fudged on those, you know. Can you compare or contrast the treatment you got when you came home with that of, say, the men from the Korean or the Vietnam War? Was I, what did I think of the, Can you, the you attitude? Of look the at the way you were met when you came home and, and then think of the, the way the Korean veterans and the Vietnam War veterans were met. Can you uh, compare them or contrast them? Well, I, I think they, like the civilians, thought that what in he heaven's name are we doing here? And the, particularly the Vietn Vietnamese War, uh, they were fighting Indian warfare, you know, sneaking through the bushes. You know? mm -hmm. Like in colonial times, they shot behind a stone wall. <laughs> and it, it, it didn't work, I mean, because the, the, the idea of warfare, you take the time of Napoleon, they just went up in mass, you know. And then when the guys had fired their weapon, and they dropped back and another group came up to fire and these guys are loading the old ramrod, you know. Yes. Well, <laughs> you, you can't fight a modern war that way. George, how important to you was serving in the military. How important was it? Yes. What did it, what Financially it, or? No, what did it mean to you for the rest of your life that you had this? Well, I felt that I'd done the right thing. You know. I'd, I'd gone, I've always been uh, interested in, I served 20 some odd years in the town meeting member of the Historical Society, tree warden. I've done that, and the Red Cross blood, I was uh, head of the Red Cross blood drive in Melbourne, and uh, United Fund, I was chair of the United Fund, so I think I've kept up doing you know, service. At the present time, I yes. started a farm, and, which is a youth service organization, the Native Community Farm. We've covered a lot of ground here this morning in, in a very extensive career. Is there any one thought or memory that you would like to share uh, on this tape with your family or the community or historians that will look at this years from now? Repeat, I'm sorry. Sure. <laughs> um, we're getting close to the end of this tape. Yeah. Is there one thing in, in your looking back at your career that you would like to share about your experiences with your family or the people who will look at this tape many years from now? Well, I think that's a good idea and we've already started on it. As you can see, we're going to have the boys take a look at this and see what a daddy do in the, <laughs> yes. in the Great War. Is there any message you would like to give your grandchildren on this tape? Yeah, or champion the right, I guess. Champion what's right and what's truthful. And pardon, be able to pardon people. I mean, you can, somebody is committed a small felony like shoplifting or something like that. I don't think it's going to do any good to put him in prison. 
he or she. But why do they? Why why does a person commit crimes? Because they're hungry, ill-clothed, or they have no shelter. And see what you can do to provide that for everybody, provided they are willing to work with you to accomplish that. George, we, we thank you very much for coming in today and appreciate your taking the time to do this. Well, it's a pleasure to see, my mirror, see myself in a mirror. Okay. okay.